Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatas. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And we are still in the book of Ezekiel, and uh, we're looking at um, Ezekiel 34. And uh, let's, uh, I don't really, know. I guess I do have some stuff highlighted. And in Ezekiel 34, we've got nothing highlighted, but in Ezekiel 35, uh, we do have stuff. So in uh, verse 5, we've got a word highlighted there. And, uh, you know, the beginning part of verse 6 is highlighted out. A little bit of verse 7, and then verse 8 is highlighted out. And, uh, you know, we just do that because the language in there is pretty graphic. I mean, the words before you can you can look at it and see for yourself, but we just don't know if, we, if you have little listening ears with you. Uh, some of, some of our, our viewers are parents and have their children, and that's fine. Um, and uh, so we just want to leave those issues up to the parents to be able to deal with in the time and season that they see fit. And so here we are. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for these words of instruction, uh, words to live by, and words to um, give us the advantage of your wisdom as we walk this earth, Lord God. I ask, Father, that you would help us to keep our heart right before you, help us to apply these words in, in the proper time, the proper season, in the proper manner. And I thank you for all these things. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here in Ezekiel 34, God deals with uh, a very interesting issue. And, you know, we, we'd seen, um, excuse me, we had seen uh, back before uh, in earlier chapters where God would deal with, you know, he might have Ezekiel speak out a prophetic word again, you know, uh, to, you know, a king or to uh, the people or to the leaders or to you know the specific group and in this case God is now dealing with uh, the shepherds the leaders of the people and he's going to go into some greater detail that um, that really gives us a lot of insight to why Jesus said some of the things that he said to the disciples and uh, why he talked to Peter about you know uh, after, when he was restoring Peter after he rose from the dead you know uh, he said uh, Peter, do you love me? Or Simon, do you love me? And Peter's, Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. You know, and Jesus called himself the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus talked also about how uh, he was sent to seek and save that which was lost. You know, and, he and he talks about how uh, he uh, was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so, very descriptive language. And so, if you take um, what it, you know, why, why does God liken the leaders to a shepherd? You know, um, then you know, and you and you ask that question, and then you begin to read a passage like this. You can begin to see why God likens the leaders to a shepherd. So, in Ezekiel thirty-four, it says, "Then this message came to me from the Lord, Son of Man." Prophesy against these shepherds, the leaders of Israel. Give them this message from the Sovereign Lord. What sorrow awaits you shepherds who feed yourselves instead of your flocks? Shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep? You drink the milk, wear the wool, and slaughter the best animals, but you let your flocks starve. You have not taken care of the weak. You have not tended the sick or bound up the injured. You have not gone looking for those who have wandered away and are lost. Instead, you have ruled them with harshness and cruelty. Now, um, back when I was pastoring, the Lord led me to this this particular passage, and so I printed out these points. I typed I, I, I typed out these points, and I printed them out, and I put them on the wall uh, so that I could see when I was working on my messages. So I, I I you know they were kind of reverse points of what Jesus what God just said here, but he's like he's like take care of the weak. You know, you didn't, you did not take care of the weak. In other words, God was expecting the shepherds to do that. So I wrote, take care of the weak. And then you have not tended the sick or bound up the injured. And so it was like, and some translations say heal the sick. And, and really that's the closer, um, closer to God's heart in, in this sense. Yeah, you, you do, you take care of, you, you take care of those who are sick. But Jesus said, uh, those who believe in me, they'll be able to lay their hands on the sick and the sick will recover. And so, yeah, absolutely pray for those who are sick. B uh, bind up the wounded. You know, those people who have, uh, they're weary from the world. They've been hurt or they've been hurt in church or they've been hurt by people. You know, tend to those wounds that they, they have suffered. You know, tend, tend to the wounded. And then 
or, or bound, bind up the bind up the wounds, so to speak, bandage up the wound. And then you have not gone looking for those who have wandered away and are lost. So you don't you you know. So it was like it's like seek those who have gone astray and seek the lost, because those are two different groups really. Uh, those who have gone astray or wandered off are those that were in the flock and they have wandered away. Seek after them. You know, go seek the lost, those who have never been a part of the flock, but they're they're just out. They're just you know, they're out in the in the wild. Find them, bring them in. You know, so the church should be a um, the church should be a place where the sheep are taken care of. You know, uh, God ex if God expected that for the Old Testament saints, He surely expects it for the new, especially when He told Peter, "Feed my lambs, take care of my flock." You know, and that's. Uh, you know, and then and then you could take this together with that scripture in Jeremiah where God said, I will give you shepherds who will feed you with knowledge and understanding, you know, uh, because he's talking about taking care of their spiritual needs uh, as well as their physical needs. And you, if you have a, a well taken care of flock, then God will begin to give more specific assignments. And so this is my personal belief on this, because people these days like to um, start a church. And it's like, well, well, we'll start a church, and now we've got enough people. We've got some money. We'll buy some land. Now we'll we'll put a building on it, and then we will. Now we'll pick our logo. We'll pick our colors. We'll, uh, you know, we'll we'll do this and that. And there's just certain things that you see, like if you go from one church to another church, there's just certain things that you're going to see that they all it's all similar. You know, they have the same type of programs. They have the same this. They have the same that, or they might have a specific thing that they do, which in my opinion is better. Um, because no, none of us are perfect, right? We're, we're all, you know, hopefully doing the best we can to please God. And so they'll have a, a specific, a, a, you know, a, you know, a task that they're, that they do. Like maybe they focus on missions or maybe they focus on, uh, you know, uh, maybe they have a, a rehabilitation ministry or a deliverance ministry or something that they do. And I believe that God will call specific churches to do those types of different things to specialize because we all have gifts uh, and calls, you know. And so, however, um, you know, I had a, a church interviewing me one time and they asked, well, what is, you know, in your in your mind, what do you see as a successful church? And I'm like, well, I'm thinking they might not like my answer <laughs> because so many churches these days are focused on that specific assignment rather than the general assignment that God has given us to care for the flock because the, the, the general assignment to take care of the flock, when people hear the word general, they think of it as, well, that's just the general thing. That's just the starting point. Yeah. If you don't have a starting point, you don't have a foundation and it's not a strong foundation. You can't build upward. And so what is the, what is the, per I mean, if I'm not taking care of my flock and I'm instead putting forth that specific call and assignment that I feel that I'm supposed to be doing, then I've defeated the whole point. Because that, that specific assignment cannot help but come through the general assignment. You know, it, it's just like in a nation. It, look at Israel. If the people weren't being taken care of, how could they fulfill any kind of special purpose God had for them in the earth? They can't even take care of themselves. The flock's not be, it being taken care of. So the, the general assignment that God gives to take care of the flock is greater than any specific assignment that God might give beyond the general one. And so um, that's the way that I answered. And it's like, I don't know if they'll like that or not, because people don't, you know, they want to, um, you know, they, 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 they have different aspirations than what God said. I mean, of just take care of the people, you know, teach the people how to take care of each other, you know, and continue with the flock and feed, feed the flock, bind up the wounded, heal the sick, seek and save those who are lost. You know, that's, that is our, our call in the earth that's and that's the you know and so anyway that's just some thoughts I have on this and so God is dealing with these shepherds because they have not taken care of the flock they've taken care of themselves instead so verse 5 so my sheep so my sheep so because of this because you've not done this because you've not taken care of the flock verse 5 so my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd and they are easy prey for any wild animal they have wandered through all the mountains and all the hills across the face of the earth, yet no one has gone to search for them. Therefore, or for this reason, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you abandoned my flock and left them to be attacked by every wild animal 
And though you were my shepherds, you didn't search for my sheep when they were lost. You took care of yourselves and left the sheep to starve. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I now consider these shepherds of my enemies, and I will hold them responsible for what has happened to my flock. I will take away their right to feed the flock, and I will stop them from feeding themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths. The sheep will no longer be their prey. So God's got some pretty harsh words, you know. Um, and sometimes you wonder, it's like why, you know, sometimes you see in the church world, I mean, not even in churches and, you know, just ministries, because there are ministries that aren't churches, you know. And sometimes we look and we say, how is that leader staying in for so long? Well, God gave these shepherds a long time to, to change their ways and do what was right. He's not just talking about the priests. Yeah, they're definitely part of it. False prophets, yeah, they were supposed to be true prophets, not false prophets, if they were even called to the office of the prophet. If they weren't called to the office of the prophet, they were called to something in God's kingdom, and they just weren't doing it. And you've got the leaders, the civil leaders, that are supposed to be doing what's right, not perverting justice. And they're all the leaders. They're all leading the people. And so God's holding them all accountable, even the king, because he's a leader. You know, and so verse 11, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. Why did Jesus say I, I was sent to seek and save that which was lost? Now, of course, the father did this too. He brought he brought them back to their their land. So the father did this, but Jesus' work is a tie to the tie to the father's work because he said, I must be about my father's business. My father's always working and so am I. So Jesus is doing the work that his father does, bringing the sheep back, finding the, the, the lost. And he's doing everything. Here. He's, he's feeding the flock. He's binding up the wounded. He's healing the sick. That's what he did. So, and we, we carry on the same work. That's what the work we're called to. So verse 13 or excuse me, verse 12 still, sorry. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the peoples and nations. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and by the rivers and in all the places where people live. Yes, I will give them good pasture land on the high hills of Israel. There they will lie down in pleasant places and feed in the lush pastures of the hills. I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace, says the Sovereign Lord. I will search for my lost ones who strayed away, and I will bring them safely home again. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. I will destroy those who are fat and powerful. I will feed them, yes, feed them with justice. And as for you, my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to his people. I will judge between one animal of the flock and another, separating the sheep from the goats. Sounds very similar to some of the things that Jesus told us. Verse 18, Isn't it enough for you to keep the best of the pastures for yourselves? Must you also trample down the rest? Isn't it enough for you to drink clear water for yourselves? Must you also muddy the rest with your feet? Why must my flock eat what you have trampled down and drink water you have fouled? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will surely judge between the fat sheep and the scrawny sheep. For you fat sheep pushed and butted and crowded my sick and, hu and hungry flock until you scattered them to distant lands. So I will rescue my flock, and they will no longer be abused. I will judge between one animal of the flock and another. I will set over them one, uh, one shepherd, my servant David. He will feed them and be a shepherd to them, and I the Lord will be their God. And my servant David will be a prince among my people. I the Lord have spoken. So at the time of this uh, prophecy, King David is long dead. He's, he's in the grave. Uh, physically speaking, of course, he's, he's an Old Testament saint, so he's with the Lord. Um, but uh, when he says, my servant David, he is saying, I'm bringing, I'm going to bring one like David, you know, because David was a shepherd to the people. He, he, God called him out of the, out of the sheep pens. This is why he's, he is likening this to David. If we read this and we think in, uh, we might say, oh, well, David was a king. Yeah, he was a king, but he started out as a shepherd and, and God called him out of the sheep pens and made him king over the people. And he knew how to shepherd the people. He knew how to take care of the people. Okay. So, uh, when he says, my servant David, now remember again, he's like, I'm really, what he's saying is I'm going to raise up one that's like David that knows how to take care of the people because, the, because David is, is long since dead, but yet his name is a name that the people know and a, a name that the people respect and know is a safe 
person. So they know when God says he's going to, he's going to put shepherd, put David over them as a shepherd, they, they will know God's going to take care of us because he's going to provide us a, a good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. So Jesus comes in the line of David, even though uh, he is called, uh, you know, he, he, he is called the son of David, but he's also the Lord over David because he's a son of David in the sense that he descended from David's line, yet he is greater than David because he is God. And so when, when, uh, uh, and, and yes, Jesus is God. He said, uh, he, he said before Abraham was, I am. Therefore he's, he was, he said he was God. Jesus is God. Now, um, David, uh, was of the sort that he would take care of the flock. And so this is what made him a man after God's own heart. He was willing to, to, take care of the flock. And so Jesus is willing to take care of the flock. And so Jesus, uh, you remember when they asked uh, Jesus, or they asked him some questions and he answered their questions. And then he said, well, what about the, what about the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said, he's the son of David. And Jesus said, well, David wrote this Psalm that under the inspiration of the spirit, he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of, of honor until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. So then he, he asked, how then can uh, if 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 uh, David said the Lord said to my Lord and he was talking about the Messiah, if he is the son of David, how can he be the Lord over David? And they couldn't answer that question. And the answer is because Jesus is God. He is in the line of David, physically speaking, but he is the son of God. So he is. Uh, so in this passage, when he says, when God says, my, I'll set over them a, ser- a shepherd, my servant, David, he's talking about Jesus what he's talking about who he's talking about excuse me verse 25 i will make a covenant of peace with my people and drive away the dangerous animals from the land then they will be able to camp safely in the wildest places and sleep in the woods without fear i will bless my people and their homes around my holy hill and in the proper season i will send the showers they need there will be showers of blessing the orchards and fields of my people will yield bumper crops and everyone will live there in safety when I have broken their chains of slavery and rescued them from those who enslaved them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. They will no longer be prey for other nations and wild animals will no longer devour them. They will live in safety and no one will frighten them. And I will make their land famous for its crops so my people will never again suffer from famines or the insults of foreign nations. In this way they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. And they will know that they, the people of Israel, are my people, says the Sovereign Lord. You are my flock, the sheep of my pasture. You are my people, and I am your God. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. And so, um, you know, we know from passages of Scripture that one of the wars that they're going, that when people attack Israel, they're going to specifically attack them because they want their resources. God has already abundantly blessed their land in these days. To the point where they're actually able to export, and so uh, their God has fulfilled this. He's saying, "I'll make it. The, their crops will be famous, and they are. In the time that we're living in, they are. God's fulfilled this. There was a time when no, when someone would have looked at the land of Israel just, you know, 70, 80 years ago, and said it's completely desolate. Nothing can even grow here. It's completely changed now because of God's favor." Chapter thirty-five. Again, a message came to me from the Lord, Son of Man, turn and face Mount Seir. And prophesy against its people. This would be the uh, Edomites, the descendants of Esau. Verse 3, give them this message from the sovereign Lord. I am your enemy, O Mount Seir, and I will raise my fist against you to destroy you completely. I will demolish your cities and make you desolate. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 5, your eternal hatred for the people of Israel has led you to destroy them when they were helpless, when I had already punished them for all their sins. Yeah. Um, so the descendants of Esau are bitter. Um, they were bitter against, against their relatives, the Israelites. Uh, and, and you, you know, you see uh, Esau, you know, when we go back and you look in Genesis, uh, Esau was angry with, with Jacob and he wanted to destroy Jacob, but Jacob fled. And that's where he, you know, when he met, um, Rachel and, and then he, you know, he, he, he when he came back and, uh, he was afraid that Esau was going to attack him, but instead Esau had forgiven him. And they lived in peace. And apparently Esau's descendants rekindled that anger and that hate. And there's a resentment against the people of Israel. Well, now, when the people of Israel were coming up to the promised land, 
before they got in, God told them, I'm not going to give you a single foot of the land of the Edomites and Mount Seir. He said, because I have given them that land. And now what we're going to see here is that the Edomites were, were envious. They, you know, they were angry with the Israelites because of that ancient history uh, between Esau and Jacob. And they let that anger fester up into a resentment and then an envy of the land that they had. And then they, and then we're going to see that they wanted that land and God takes serious issue with that because that's the land he gave to the Israelites. So verse 5, he says, Your eternal hatred for the people of Israel led you to destroy them when they were helpless, when I had already punished them for all their sins. Your turn has come. Verse 7, I will make Mount Seir utterly desolate. All who try to escape, and it, it, uh, or destroying anyone who try to escape, and any who return. Verse 9, I will make you desolate forever. Your cities will never be rebuilt. Then you will know that I am the Lord. For you said, the lands of Israel and Judah will be ours. We will take possession of them. What do we care that the Lord is there? So there was a disrespect of God. And, and so God, but God makes the, so why are they saying this? Why are they saying, well, we'll take the land now? Well, because they see this opportunity, right? They're, 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 they're next, they're, na they're a neighboring nation. And Babylon comes in and just, just completely, you know, they pull everybody out and there's not really anybody there. And so they are like, we'll take the land. And it's like, do you not understand that God gave the land to it, the, the, the Israelites? The only reason that they're gone is because God himself removed them. And he already stated that he's planning on bringing them back. So what they're doing is they're trying to do something. They're trying to take this land that they have no right to take. And they're doing it because of this deep hatred that they've harbored for all these, all these centuries. And they, they haven't let it go. This is why forgiveness is so important. So... Uh, because if we if we harbor unforgiveness, we step into territory that we don't have any dominion over. And, you know, if we're, if we're holding on to unforgiveness, then we are keeping a person in. We have set ourselves up as a judge and we're holding a court that we have no right to hold. Because when we forgive somebody, we're saying, God, they owe me nothing. And I'm, I'm canceling that debt. They owe me nothing. It's now in your court. And so now God can deal with it. And we have let it go. And now God will deal with it. And so that's what they should have done is let it go. But instead, they end up in trouble because they won't let it go. So um, so then he says, again, I'll just read verse 10. For you said the lands of Israel and Judah will be ours. We will take possession of them. What do we care if the Lord is there? Therefore, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I will pay back your angry deeds with my own. I will punish you for all your acts of anger, envy, and hatred. And I will make myself known to Israel by what I do to you. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have heard every contemptuous word you spoke against the mountains of Israel. For you said they are desolate. They have been given to us as food to eat. In saying that, you boasted proudly against me, and I have heard it all. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. The whole world will rejoice when I make you desolate. You rejoiced at the desolation of Israel's territory. Now I will rejoice at yours. You will be wiped out, you people of Mount Seir, and all who live in Edom. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And that's one of those nations that doesn't even exist to this day. And so it just is, you know, all these nations that are completely ruined. Everyone that God said was going to be completely ruined are. They're gone from history. But the ones he said he was going to preserve, like Egypt, uh, they're still there. You know, um, it's really amazing. So God's word is true. And his promises are sure. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you for all those who tune in here with me. I ask that you bless them for their time that they give. Uh, I ask that you would bless them greatly, Lord God, and to help us all increase all of our knowledge together, Lord God, increase our, our uh, the understanding of our hearts and help us to be discerning in these times and give us the things that we need to be praying for and seeking after. I thank you for these things. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.